AI won't take your job, someone using AI will. You may have heard this phrase last year. If you want a head start into 2024, join the free masterclass on AI and training design, organized by NewSpring in collaboration with leading AI and learning researcher Dr. Philippa Hartman. On Tuesday, February 13, we'll dive headfirst into leveraging AI for designing your training. Visit thenewspring.com or the link in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Curiosity, resilience, brain health, compliance, equity, diversity and inclusion, learning styles, AI literacy, retrieval, augmented generation. Words, words, words. But do these words mean anything to you? Do they raise any emotions? Excitement? Boredom? If so, you probably work in learning. And that's what we're talking about in this episode of The Learning Hack, the language of learning. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now, guess what? Learning is learning cool. Is cool. cool. Learning, is cool. Learning, is cool. learning is cool. Learning is cool. I'm learning. Learning is fun. Knowledge, Knowledge is power. Knowledge is education. My guest this time on The Learning Hack first came to my attention because he seemed to get more wound up than most people about the buzzwords that afflict our industry. There's a man who cares about language, I thought. So I booked him to speak at a conference I was running. This is years ago, but now here he is on The Learning Hack. Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact, who is he? Hack Facts. Based in Denmark, Peter Manish Reber is Head of Digital Learning at Novo Nordisk, Europe's most valuable company, with a market value of half a trillion dollars. Peter has been working with digital learning for more than 10 years, some of that involving virtual reality. With a BSc from Copenhagen Business School and a strong focus on learning analytics, Peter says he is addicted to making L&D accountable and getting the right training to people at the right time and in the right place. My co-host on our sister podcast, Great Minds on Learning, Donald Clark, blew my mind before Christmas when he told our audience something that the famous philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said about language and thought. Where well, we usually tend to think that think it comes first. We think of something, then we find the words to express it. Wittgenstein said, no, language comes first. Our ability to use language results in thought. If language is that important in shaping how we think, then surely the language we use about learning must be all the more critical. Peter Manish Reba had some really interesting things to say on that subject. <laughs> So hi, Peter Manish Reba. It's great to have you on the podcast and welcome to The Learning Hack. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Good. We're going to be talking about how we use language and learning, i.e. how important the words and phrases we use to talk about it are. Uh, how certain framings can be either liberating or confining to thought. People will have their pet peeves. And don't worry, we'll get to yours in a minute. But first, I'd like to ask you to address the, the question in a general way, uh, in a widescreen way. Is the language we use when we talk about learning really fit for purpose at the moment? Oh, that's a really good question. And uh, I'm going to come up with a, or start with a terrible answer. Because it does really depend, doesn't it? <laughs> like a lot of lot of things in life. I'm also getting older, so more pragmatic and and all that. But it really depends on the context and how you use the language and for what purposes. So, if you're talking about the purpose where we sitting in companies trying to help our populations learn and develop in the right direction for the company and the individuals then I think we have a problem and a misfit between what we are presented to uh, in the marketplace and what we experience in real life. And this is probably why we have this conversation around buzzwords is that we experience that some of these things that becomes trends or buzzwords or things that we talk a lot about, they're very hard to materialize in, in the way they were uh, intended to be by the potential that we're we're getting uh, we're getting in the marketplace. So 
um, that misfit is difficult to cope with because you know a lot of these people, consultants, vendors in the marketplace, they need to sell their products. And I hope we can get into this a little bit deeper during the conversation. We in learning development in companies are very restrained when it comes to resources and budgets, but we also have a very large scope and a lot of people to cater to with individual contexts. So we are all looking for that silver bullet that can help us help a lot of people at the same time with very few resources. And I think that's some of the reason behind it. All right. So it, it sounds from that answer that you, you've kind of got the vendor market slightly in your sights there. And we we know that vendors are terrible. I've worked on behalf of a lot of vendors as a marketing person. And I know we are awful. You know, we are, we're very addicted to buzzwords. We like to bring in new ones all the time. How about on the on on the practitioner side? Um, we do see this thing where, you know, you'll have an abstract noun will come up and everybody will kind of run after that. And these things like, I don't know, without being too controversial, curiosity, um, diversity, uh, resilience, the, 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 these things are, uh, come from the practitioner side. Is, is, is that healthy that we're so addicted to uh, this furious kind of trend hound behavior almost over certain abstract nouns? Um, yeah, is it helpful? To some extent, I think it is because it's also both from the vendor side and the practitioner side driving the, you know, development, innovation, thought, uh, thoughts around how we can do better uh, forward. So I think we're very good in the L&D space on both sides to think ahead and think of potential. How, how could it be? What could we do? How could we apply technology? How could we apply a new line of thought based on what we see? Um, to fix some of the issues that we have today. But you have to think of on the practitioner side, we're also in learning development, a little bit of, of a sales uh, team internally in a company um, because we don't have that seat at the table. We are not the production line where if we don't deliver, the company will you know, turn over. We won't be making business and pay out salaries next month if that doesn't work. But when it comes to learning and development, next month, if <laughs> if we're not there, how is that going to impact the company? I mean, we can all in thought say that's not a good thing because development is super important. We know that from research. We know that from all of our feelings around what's important and people want to be developed. But bottom line is we don't have that seat at the table with that strong voice. So we also have to come and sell our things a little bit internally saying, here's that new shiny thing. Here's this new concept. Here's what we all can feel in, in, in you know, in, in where we are, you know, in 24 and 2020, it was remote work, right? Because the COVID hit us. So everyone had to jump on that bandwagon. And now it's AI. And, and before that, it's been, it's been other things. Um, and I've actually tried to put a list together for our conversation today to figure okay. out, you know, talk about some of these things that arrive um, with time. So we have to jump on it as well to sell it internally to get, you know, our things done and also do some of the, you know, the things that we think will help our population. So we also have to sell it internally. So uh, I, can, I think that's kind of the game. Yeah. And we look to the vendor market and see what's possible. And then some of it's snake oil and some of it isn't. There's a lot of great people working on the vendor side and vendors who are doing a terrific job providing us with solutions and products and thoughts that we can really use. Um, and then, and then there's some, there aren't, I guess that's, that's the same for any marketplace really. Okay. So let's get to your list. I feel you're itching to get to it. Let's have a few of the words and terms that really get your goat. Yeah. Um, a bit of background yeah. for the, for the listeners here. Several years ago, I booked you for a conference session with a friend of the podcast, Carl Chrysostomo. Uh, which we called If Memory Serves, and here goes our uh, podcast clean rating, buzzword bullshit, bingo. <laughs> uh, no doubt things have changed a bit since then. Um, and, and it sounds to me like you've kind of, you, 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 you perhaps lost some of your youthful edge with this. But um, in a similar vein, what are the buzzwords around at the moment that you feel are the most misleading and unhelpful? Um, it sounds like you've got a long list. I was going to say top three, but let's start with th with three, maybe to keep it in management. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. 
Uh, yeah, I am losing my edge a little bit. I think it's it's part of getting older. Um, but I'll try and keep it up for now for our conversation because I think it is important um, to be on the edge sometimes um, to get a message through. So, looking at historically what we've what we've done in LND and what we talk about every year, there's conferences, there's top ten on CLOs minds, right? What we talk about, and what we do. Um, and if I had to pick a top three of all these things, I think I'd probably um, We've been talking about that before uh, in other uh, contexts, but um, micro learning is one of the ones that I think exemplifies very well how you can take something super, super simple and make it into a very fluffy, buzzy thing that everyone needs to jump on and think, oh, this is amazing. This is a term that we can all, we'll all, you know, turn around the way we practition uh, L&D. So that's definitely one of them. The other one could be uh, number two, maybe. I'm not going to prioritize. I'm just going to take three. Learning in the flow of work is oh, yeah. also interesting um, to me because it covers something that's happened forever. I mean, who hasn't been learning in the flow of work? And I know it's the perception of that we as L&D people should cater to that process saying, how do we support people with something in the flow of work? And we've been doing that forever and in different various contexts. It's called performance support. It's called other things. But learning in the flow of work just really sounds like something a consultancy would sell and not something that you could talk to an, an, you know, an, an employee about in the company you work in. It, it's just, um, yeah, a little bit too fluffy in my opinion. So that's that's the other thing. Um, and so, the third? Yeah, yeah the third one um, is difficult because some of these terms are really used in contexts where there's amazing versions of them if you interpret them the right way and then used in a in a terrible way they could be uh, in, you know they could be different things okay i think one of the other things um i'm constantly challenging probably top three here so now here comes number three is the digital transformation term uh, oh, interesting it's used in so many different ways for so many different things. And okay. I just don't know the use of that in learning and development. It's interesting also compared with how we're doing it and what we've done with this digitalization over the last 25 years. Okay, should we go to trigger, drill into those three a bit more? First of all, micro learning. Um, can I give a, a really kind of cynical take on that from my yes. vendor perspective? Uh, that, that there's always been this big problem with if you work in a vendor tech learn company, especially kind of uh, custom custom content development, which was a, a, a lot of my life's been spent with. You know, you typically have a kind of 20, 30 grand um, project and all the salespeople sit around on Monday morning at the, at the meeting and, and say what they've managed to sell. And you know, uh, contracts get deferred, they get pushed on, and this makes your kind of revenue flow very lumpy. Micro learning to me seemed ideal because suddenly you've got something that costs a lot less. And, it, right. and a salesperson can sell that. Also, when you come a new prospect, there is this terrible uh, phrase that um, salespeople would use, which is, you know, well, we haven't got them to spend any significant, talking about a client account, I uh, haven't got them to spend anything significant as yet, but we managed to sell them a bit of micro learning. It's blood in the water. <laughs> Fair game. I mean, you know, people say salespeople are sharks. Not true at all. But I mean, the use of that phrase is kind of, when we're talking about language, is, is kind of indicative. So I'm, I'm wondering to what extent the the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the P&L um, and cash flow uh, constraints and needs of the vendor market tend to drive some of these buzzwords. And I was suspected it's sort of like that with micro learning. From a buyer perspective, what do you think about that? That's really interesting and human yeah. and the way the world works. Yeah. And then I guess it's up to us, the buyers, to see through that or do our homework. Um, and I, I think the, the, some of the, some of the reason behind, I'm not sure that's completely correct, but this is just my perspective of how this arrived is instead of having these big clunky courses, online courses, long e-learnings, longer learning interventions, it would be ideal to break them up uh, because people would be able to, to digest it um, 
on the you know on the go or easier on minor chunks and that would make the learning experience better than pulling them through a long thing mm-hmm. which is a really really interesting argument so instead of giving them one long poor experience you'll give them 15 potentially poor experiences with you know difficulties in in probably connecting them over time because that's how humans work you don't just turn back to the same pace that you i mean you've moved on so so and not contextualizing this into a why do we even want to do this and what's the problem that we're trying to solve is so interesting and and it's it's one of the examples where i think we as learning development people jump on the easy you know it's easy to do it's easy to break things up in it's it's lower production uh, costs it's probably at least um it's potentially you know as you say you can you can buy it faster you can get it out faster you can deploy it without anyone really screaming at you because it's really really long and boring and it's easy to do it's easy mm. just to break up your stuff and then serve it as my, micro learning which is a new interesting concept and we're forgetting the whole process around asking ourselves why does this even exist if it's super long and boring why don't we take a look at what the problem is supposed to solve is and then design it the way that it excites people and motivates people if they need that or or something different so it's, do you think uh, micro learning yeah. kind of imposes a false binary you know yeah. long long bad short good to some extent and but then there's other ways of i mean micro learning if you want to put that into into a category you could you could look at tiktok you could look at youtube you could look at other things where you could argue that that would be micro learning well, it's also just a TikTok video or a YouTube video, right? Why would mm. that be a micro learning experience? I think that's our learning developments kind of need to label things to justify that we're part of it. Um, so no one cares at the other side, the recept, you know, re- receiving party, uh, the employee does not care about whether this is micro learning or something different that we've labeled it. Uh, they don't care. This is a video that's supposed to be about a topic that's, you know, supposed to make me better at a thing I, I want to get better in or, or need to get better at. So it hmm. doesn't matter to them. I'm going to kind of argue against my initial cynical, cynical thrust there and say, well, there, there may well be some, um, I'm not an expert in learning theory, despite having a podcast on the subject, but there may be some good reasons in learning theory why, you know, the, the kind of more bite-sized bits of learning actually have a kind of utility that we overlook with the long courses. Uh, also, if you fit this into the context of the working day and how little, how difficult it is for people to get long periods of time to concentrate on one thing and to time box, you know, a trendy phrase, uh, micro learning fits in there really well. So it, it, in terms of context abuse, which is always a, a, a kind of consideration for any type of product design, micro learning perhaps he's doing something and people are getting learning there in ways that they wouldn't normally. Um, but of course, this re- re- relates to the learning in the flow of work thing. Do you, you want to talk more about that? Because we've had um, Bob Mosher on the podcast and uh, various other people who've stood up for the concept of mm. learning in the flow of work, uh, particularly as regards the shortage of time and working context and so on and, and other bits of learning theory. Would you like to yeah. unpack your, your objection a bit? Um, well, I'm not objecting to, again, to the to the good intentions that Bob or other people would have to keep this concept in play, because I think they've got really good intentions and all the reasons behind keeping it in is great. It's just the conceptualization of a thing that has always been there. I mean, everyone in human history, having had a job at some point, have learned in the flow of what they did because that's how we develop with experiences that, but it, it, you know, if we're talking about intentional learning interventions in the flow of work, it is a super, super difficult thing to do. And we can get back to that. I think it's some of the other um, conversations that we're going to have during the hour here, but it's, it's just, if you don't have context, it'll always feel irrelevant for people or pushy or annoying, or why am I going to do this? Cause I'm actually, just on this task and I'm really focused on getting here or I'm doing this right now. So why are you, why are you breaking my focus? Why am I looking at this email when I'm supposed to? And, and some of those emotions that you'll get in a working context. Um, so you might also be in a, uh, in a, in a flow situation where you've got a new project and you want, and you're seeking learning on something. 
The Learning Hack podcast is supported by Learning News, the learning sector's newswire. Rob and his team are good friends of the podcast, and we really value the help and advice we've had from them, and they do a great job. For the very latest news from around the learning sector, for interviews with learning leaders, the latest from learning sector vendors and features on workplace learning, go to learningnews.com. I want to ask you a question, uh, John. So would you rather be in a seven minute micro learning experience on the topic um, that you're interested in, or would you be rather be in a two hour community workshop experience with other people, just having a conversation, learning from them? What would you rather do? Uh, You should never ask me questions. You get very long answers. (laughs) But I'll, I'll try to give it short. Um, I'd, I'd I'd probably vote for the for the former. I, lock, locking two hours out of my day is difficult. Okay. Um, you know, for for obvious reasons, I can think of a, you know, I can think of a great micro learning example where you know I, I'm kind of studying sound sound design as a as as cause I edit these podcasts and trying to get better at that all the time. Uh, I got interrupted by a, a little snippet from YouTube saying, you know, this is why, how EQ relates to phase, which sound, you know, people who know about sound engineering will understand there's a relationship between equalization and phase. I never knew that. It took me about five, 10 minutes to access that piece. And afterwards I knew more than I did before. And then I could go back to, back to working life. Um, Ideally, of course, I'd like the uh, the the longer two hour session, but I'd be very selective about that. You know, who's in that session, who's leading it, what's it about, how is it structured, before kind of committing to that. And like everybody else, I think I sign up to more webinars than I ever attend. <laughs> that was a good answer. Um, oh, thank you. So I wasn't I wasn't fishing for one or the other. Uh, actually, but I was, I was, you know, on the it depends curve again because yeah. some some of the pre work that we need to do as L and D practitioners, designing training and learning, and I see way too little of is again taking departure in the problem that we're trying to solve, and then putting in the formats that we're trying to push out to solve that problem in a context of, and now I'm going to quote um, um, Nick Sexton Jones and. The 5DI framework is what you want people to think, feel, and do differently. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Mm -hmm. Because if you know what you want people to think differently after your learning intervention or do differently or feel differently, then you also know what format to put on to make that happen. It's very rare that an e-learning 45-minute duration about something will create an emotion in people other than frustration. And... This is this not to um, um, <laughs> to say something bad about e-learning. I've done that enough over time, and in a in a in the right context, in the right subject, in the right again back to the solving the problem. If it if it matches all the um, you know it ticks off all the boxes, great. Then release that format, deploy that, no worries. But it just rarely is that solution, and we kind of default to those things. And it's the same with micro learning. So if we have a concept that we believe in, then we try and spread it out over a lot of different contexts where it probably doesn't always belong to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. And it's the dilemma that we continuously work with in learning development is again, back to the point in the beginning is we have a scarcity of resources to cater to a vast amount of different contexts, people, and their daily lives and how to develop the skills, results, and everything that they need to do in their jobs, which we are uh, set out to do. We just can't do that without sometimes grabbing onto these overall terms like micro-learning. That's mm-hmm. going to work. Then people are going to learn much you know, much better. It's going to be much better for their daily lives, their calendars, their all sorts of things. And then we just spread that out wide and we cling ourselves to the hope that this concept will save us and make life easier for us to cater to what we really want to do is help people. And that's the idea that I'm kind of challenging is all these bandwagons, all these buzzwords. One thing is that we get so attached to them that we miss 
you know, people can't remember what was the buzzword three, five, seven, ten years ago. And we don't even follow up. And did we actually do that? Did we actually, you know, solve some of the things we wanted to do with those terms? Or did we just move on to the next one? We probably just moved on to the next one, most of us, because that's how that's how we work. Um, but apart from following up on them, do we also contextualize them into saying, does it work for everything that we're doing? Or can we use this concept particularly in this context or this context? And I think that's probably closer to the answer. Um, and some of the very smart people I know in L&D, and L&D is packed with smart people, actually do that in how they work. But the way the conversation is in the L&D um, echo chamber and, uh, and market is different. It is a, this is going to solve everything for you. That's mm. the thing I'm challenging. Okay. I mean, there's also the danger that buzzwords can be used to excuse a bad intervention. So, for instance, you've, you've got something that you need to train people in. You know it's going to be need to be quite intensive, but you've only got budget for, I don't know, 10 minutes. Um, and people say, well, that's not really going to do it, is it? Well, yeah, micro learning. Um, <laughs> you know, you use the buzzword and it kind of gets you out of, of jail free. I think we should move on to your to your third one. Digital transformation. It, it does um, escape our minds, right? That's interesting because that's quite a large scale thing, isn't it? That yeah. Would be done at a strategic level. Now, now, what is it exactly about is going wrong with that, do you think? Yeah, um, I've talked to some very smart people about the term. And actually, there's a, there's a Danish guy who has a podcast about it. And he's super smart. And he's actually taught me some things about what this term really covers and and um and what I, you know, I should I should probably ramp up on my knowledge around it before I, I challenge it. But I still don't. This is a term that we use without knowing what it really means. And we use it on a strategic level and we use it to install our learning systems and platforms, which is then being part of a digital transformation, mobile first or whatever it is. I mean, digital has been here for a long time and consumer wise. Yeah. 30 years or more in, in learning development where we've been taking a digital transformation track to phase up, say, we've got a system you can access, you've, you've got on your mobile, you can watch all sorts of formats, you can interact with it, uh, you can put on a headset, you can chat with it now, and all, all sorts of things. But what does that really mean? And how have we really performed when it comes to that? Because, and I don't remember if it, this was a Churchill um, quote or Mike Tyson or someone else. So please excuse me. There's a yeah, little bit of a difference between the quotes two. Quotes are usually one or the other. Aren't they? Yeah, exactly. It's probably not Mike Tyson though, but, but um, you know, it's great. Things are amazing. Concepts are amazing until they get punched in the face by reality. Oh yeah. That's Mike Tyson. That's but Mike Tyson. He did adapt it from an earlier boxer. Yeah. I, I, I okay. had to research that just the other day. And yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everyone uh, has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. That's the one. Thank you. Yeah. And and some of this around digital transformation, you present that on, you know, on a slide and no one will really know what it means. So what does that mean for learning development? Does it mean that we are evolving with the tools that we are using, the platforms, the technology? Is that the transformation? Is it with people and how they use technology? Is that transforming and how are we adapting to that? So what are we really meaning when we're saying, digital transformation is top of our mind in learning development. I don't know. In 2021, it was one of the most used terms in learning development, digital transformation. Mm. But we're still caught up. We're still caught up in legacy systems in a lot of companies that doesn't represent any modern digital transformation. We still have workers all around who don't have access to devices in their daily work, can interact with all the nice and cool things that we're putting on the shelves. And we're just not thinking of the consequences of keep modernizing these things within digital transformation and talking about that with some of the hygiene factors not just not being there. And, and it frustrates me a little bit when I see some of these things. The other thing that frustrates me is and this comes from features and new widgets and stuff that you can put on learning technology today and you can add to your platform or you can do this and that. And I know, again, it's a premise. They need to sell their product. I get it. I totally get it. 
But most of the time, when you dig a little bit deeper, it is it is not thoroughly worked through. And I know a lot of these uh, vendors in the learning market are also under pressure and a scarcity of resources. They're not Google. They're not Apple. They can't put a million people and in, in hours into developing their features. They have to develop something now because the market says so. We need to sell the product so we integrate with it. And then we call it something. And then when we get it in the companies, it doesn't really work that way always. Uh, and, and I think that is, that is where I'm like, let's stop using these fluffy terms that we really don't understand what means. And let's not, you know, wrap them in gift paper or whatever we call it, you know, chocolate. So let's not chocolate cover this. Let's talk about it as it is um, so that we understand each other. That's probably more the, the challenge uh, here that we usually, we usually do. Isn't that difficult sometimes, though? I mean, often you feel digital transformation. We're going to have a digital transformation program. It's kind of code for, oh, my God, we're falling behind. You know, we have competitors <laughs> who who have this new stuff or they're in a new market. Or, you know, like, like we, we see this with kind of traditional media going online because they, 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 they've they got kind of competition from social media platforms. Um, you see this with kind of newspapers trying to keep up. And... Uh, and then kind of film, video, and the streamers and so on. Um, we're all in a kind of constant process of digital transformation, really. But organizations perennially, and quite a lot nowadays, will think, oh, my God, we're falling behind. We have to do something. We we have to have a big kind of initiative that we can give a name to, that we can get some budget for to upgrade the computers. <laughs> you know, um, yep. And it, nobody's got the kit that we need and so on. We we need to kind of maybe change. We, we've we got to fire a few people. Um, and that gets wrapped up into digital transformation. But one of the things yeah. that always confused me about it was where you would see people say, uh, we're going to give you um, some examples. Here are five examples of tr digital transformation projects that have worked. And I, I think, well, does that mean it's over? <laughs> you know, we we nailed digital transformation. Yeah. Okay, we we did a program that started in uh, 2019, finished in 2021. We completely transformed digitally in this organization. Okay, then ChatGPT comes along. Do, do, do you need another digital transformation program? Or no, nope, we've done that. We've transformed. We we don't change anymore. I mean, really, it's a it's a constant thing, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is a constant thing, and. It is super interesting because it can cover so many things. And we do need to, I mean, we have it as well. I mean, I think the intention behind digital transformation and portraying it as something we need to take seriously is good because we do need to keep, keep up internally in companies, in the marketplace, everywhere. These technologies are coming in and we do need to relate to them and even better, uh, you know, try and work, work on them with them to do us a favor, to make life easier for us or the people that we serve. So that responsibility, I think, is super important. And that intention is really, really good. But when you, when you wrap it into digital transformation, as you say, it's not over. It's a continuous process. It becomes that fluffy buzzword that no one understands. And an employee somewhere on a product line, if I start talking about digital transformation, they will zone out immediately. No one knows what it means. Mm -hmm. And... If it, is that me picking up my phone, interacting with this system, and then I do, you know, and this easier for me than before, and no one knows. So you have to really nail what the details and the problems, and also look back at the, was this actually better than it was before? So if we look at one, I've got, this is a wonderful example. It's not it's not my example. I'm 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 not stealing this, but I'm borrowing it from um, from a guy called Dennis Nurmark, who is a, a Danish author. Um, he's looked into some of the effects of digital transformation and digitalization of things. And um, so when I go and, you know, deliver my youngest at the kindergarten, uh, we now have to check them in on an iPad. So we have to go and, and open up the iPad find my son's picture and he's now checked into the kindergarten so everyone knows where he is. Now that was a process before which was paper-based. I just went over and there was a list and I wrote his name, put the time in and that was it. So that digital transformation cost a lot of money to set up that system. There's 
security, data security. There's all sorts of people now working on this solution. And it was done to make it more efficient. But actually, there's more people working on this than there was before. And the data behind it is not being used anywhere, obviously, because that my son was in kindergarten. I mean, hmm, it doesn't really change a lot. There, you know, the, the, the argument is that now we can staff better and more accurately in the kindergartens, but that doesn't change. I mean, the budget doesn't change because of these numbers. So it is, that's a really interesting example of where digitalization might not have made a lot of sense. But when we talk digital transformation and you say the feeling of being behind, that carries a lot of the development without asking, is this actually necessary? Do we need another learning platform that can do this slightly better? Or should we think of this whole problem that we're trying to solve differently? And maybe not only default to digital. Um, yeah, and, and, and this is again, we're so breathtaken by digital opportunities and solutions that we probably don't think a lot about, is this worth it? Or is it actually needed in this space? And you could look at, at that with virtual reality, augmented reality. You can see it in the AI space a lot right now, where some you know people are very, and we don't listen a lot to them, but there's some good people on, on LinkedIn and other places who's like, uh, should we just stop and think for a while and see if this actually, you know, applies to this, this context? Uh, or should we just jump on the train and then just apply it everywhere for everything and see what happens? Um, it's interesting. Before we move on to other questions, and I, I did want to talk about AI a little bit, uh, inevitably. Um, are there any that we've done your top three? Are there any others you'd like to kind of um, give a mention to quickly? Bubbling under, maybe. Well, um, again, back to the intention behind it and um, and all. That's great. So gamification is one of them uh, that oh, yeah. we've been talking about a lot. And now not so popular anymore. Um, we're not talking a lot about it, but but there was also, you know, in the heat of the moment, everyone needed a badge or something else for completing stuff. And that was hot. And uh, in interactivity and e-learnings where you can now turn around boxes and you can make them fly and fit and, and all that stuff and quizzes at the end is, is also kind of lost on the radar, but was very popular at the time. Mm. And gamification is actually a super powerful thing if you use it right, again, back to the context. Um, but that's one of them where I'm thinking that was in, no, not probably not used in the right way um, and died a little bit. Other things could be around adaptive learning and how we use that. Lifelong learning as well. I mean, who's not learning lifelong and what does that mean? And intentions behind taking people on, you know, onboarding them in your company and then thinking about their whole journey inside the company and where we want to take them and until they leave, uh, potentially for retirement or, or somewhere else is a great thing. I mean, we should do that more. But calling it lifelong learning is just fluffy. Yeah. That's the fluffiness. You, it's you, the fluffiness. You. It is how we how we talk about these things without you know context and substance really. And it might just be because it's on LinkedIn that I see most of it. So there's it's not a substance social media thing. But that's not completely true because there are a lot of great people really posting some amazing things with a lot of substance in it. So more of that and less of the fluffy stuff. I, I want to move on to the, the obligatory AI question, uh, obligatory in every single podcast nowadays, but I think it's totally legitimate to bring it into this discussion because mm -hmm. uh, talking about AI, for most of its evolution, it's been about maths. Uh, but since the explosion in generative AI last year, it's now something that we can interact with through language that all of us um, have to, to varying degrees of proficiency. How do you see that affecting the way we use language in learning? Obviously, it's given us a great potential benefit, as as you mentioned, a lot of people talking about it, get on the train now. Um, and you'll know the sort of people I'm thinking about there. Um, it, it, it gives us that benefit because more of us are proficient in language than in maths or coding. But what effects might this expend, expanded accessibility to AI have in learning, do you think? And the way that we talk about it. That's a really good question. And it it's, I mean... I think this is a more powerful wave that we've ever seen before because it's driven by a product, ChatGPT, that came out and really 
really surprised the world on how the quality of, of how it worked. I mean, I think we're all breathtaking taken by that to some extent and now come comes the after waves where we can see some of the limitations and some of the potential uh, data um, issues um, ethical issues around it and and also you know all sorts of other things that's coming in in the secondary waves i actually think it's quite interesting that they chose to just release it without asking anyone about copyright and then you know taking those battles afterwards because they wanted probably the world to see how yeah. magnificent a product it is. And it did really take us from um, next to nothing to a whole different level. And we in L&D did talk about AI and machine learning years ago um, in pockets. I know Filter has been working with it for quite a while. Yes. Um, algorithms and how to, how to sort your content, for one, is to how do you tag, how do you filter, how do you uh, manage your content better with machine learning algorithms running through relevance um, questions, stuff like that. And artificial intelligence coming up with replies and answers to deep neural networks and other things. So it's not completely new, but now everyone has to relate to it. Yes. And, and I'm just seeing different waves now. There are very smart people talking about how we can use it in pockets right now for various different use cases. And there are companies making things on the vendor, vendor market that I've seen that makes a lot of sense, which will either be easy or very difficult to implement because of for, for different reasons. And then there's the whole third thing. I'm I'm not so worried about it because I, I actually don't see it a lot, but but AI content is really bothering me quite a lot. Um, to, it seems like, and I've I've received some, and maybe it's just me getting old again, and, and you know, but watching some of those uh, synthesia or other um, videos that are AI made with avatars um, or yourself standing there talking in a kind of a, it's still very mechanic, and I don't know if it would be better if it looked more real, which I think the you know it'll it'll become a lot more real uh, as as it develops, but that bothers me quite a little bit because that personal touch, that human touch is still something I, I think and ex experience is incredibly important for people to trust and wanting to engage with things. Um, but where's and, the worry uh, there, Peter? Is the, is the worry that um, because we get all this kind of synthetic AI-generated stuff that looks almost human, yeah. it pushes out the, the real human stuff and we lose that? Or is the worry that the... The AI gets more and more human, <laughs> and um, uh, to to the to to the point where it really convinces us, it, it really passes the Turing test. You know, those things don't quite yeah. at the moment, yeah. but but it gets to the point where it does, and then there there is another category of worry. Which of those are you falling into? <clears throat> I'm actually not worried about. E I mean, oh yeah, I am super worried about both, but it's on a different premise, and it's back to the whole um, point of. Everything I've I've said today is if it doesn't if the content doesn't origin or come from a problem or an opportunity something we want to solve something we want to improve for people or companies or whatever we want to do but we want to improve something that is the whole premise of learning development is to have help people learn and develop for their own good or for the company's good so it's a it's all about that. And if there's nothing that we've defined that we need to solve and we just keep, you know, thinking about, well, we've made this new process. Everyone needs to be informed about that. Let's just have the AI make the materials and send it out in the best way. That's not going to solve the whole premise. That's not going to, it's not going to do anything different, but make the delivery easier for everyone. Um, so, so that, 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 that is interesting as, as long, but yeah, I don't know. Cause, and we'll have to talk, yeah, you have to talk to that that that's kind of what Egler uh exactly. was saying, you know, the products and the problem. Um and I want to argue against that slightly and say, Good. isn't that always the case with technology that it comes up with solutions to problems that we didn't have? I mean, mm. you know, what problem does TikTok solve? <laughs> that's mean, a really good Good question. Um, you know, it doesn't solve it doesn't the solve problem a... that we really we were all wondering around saying, Oh God, if only there were a type of social media that, that was really addictive, um, really short form. 
uh, and then I could do what I was kind of, you know, on the loo or waiting for a bus or whatever. You know, no, no, nobody had that problem. You know, people, got, people in the 19th century got along perfectly well without TikTok or, or, or iPhones for that matter. Technology changes the world and it gives us great affordances, I think, is the word. It's, it's an interesting word, affordances, because it kind of glosses over particularly this problem that, it, that technology gives you stuff that changes your life, but it doesn't necessarily solve a problem because you didn't have a problem that is solved by that thing. True. Um, so that, that that's in the eye of the beholder, right? So did Facebook solve a problem? Does TikTok solve a problem? Or other products that come in, does the learning management system really solve a problem? Or does it chase an opportunity? So I think someone saw an opportunity in something and then they said, hey, we can put some some things together here that would make that opportunity come alive. And then not thinking about some of the butterfly effects or thinking about it and just not caring, but some of the butterflies effects around, so what's going to happen when we do this? And what, what's going to be the change in the effect? And maybe we didn't know, um, but how, how can we calculate that? And back to the premise of um, what Eglis says as well about the product and, and also if the AI can define a problem or an opportunity and help us, you know, solve some of those, that would be amazing. But it all relies on the data. And as you probably know, and maybe if you've discovered that previously, and I know there's other people talking about it as well, the, the quality of data in the world is not always amazing. And especially also inside companies. And there's also very, very good ethical reasons for not using data to, for some things, right? And, and there's copyright infringement and there's all sorts of other things. So if you want a machine to calculate something and, and you want AI, as I understand it, I'm not an AI expert at all. I've tried to, to learn a lot about it since last summer. But if you want AI to be creative and you want machine learning to be able to sort out the database, you do need quality data. And if you're acting on biased data, that's a big problem. If you're acting on in, insufficient data, that's also a big problem right now, at least. So if your data set is not accurate, you won't get to the solutions you need. And some things in life, and I'm, this is probably me getting old and, and a little bit soft, some things are not tangible to that extent yet. So if we're dealing with humans and behavioral change, it's not always that we can just attach a machine to that based on the data set we have, and then that will solve the problem because we are humans. And maybe someday AI and machine learning and all those things can predict human behavior. I've seen some interesting studies on that lately. Um, so maybe it can, but I don't think it's still, it's still, it's not still not there. And most of the things that we're trying to change for people, with people, and to help people are still behavioral. And a good old-fashioned analysis of what's the problem and what does it take to solve it. And then AI right now can help us get to the opportunities of how we articulate the problem based on the data that we've done, we've had, and we've crunched, and we've done the analysis. So... That's where I think AI can help us really now is to get quicker to a solution for people and guiding people better based on the data and being creative around guiding people to things they probably didn't think about in the context of the data that we have. And that, that's how we're trying to work with AI. I'm not saying it's the right, the, the right way and there's probably things I'm over, over, overlooking here. I'm, I would recommend anyone to talk to Eglis. She's, she's amazing. Um, I just don't see... AI content right now being the way forward. The world does not need more content. And I am not sure that people are putting the right problems into the machine, letting it solve something. So if it's just an easier way to get content done, stop doing it, in my opinion, in most of the cases. Um, but yes. <laughs> again, it's, it's, a, it's not a black and white um, equation. It's not, it's not um, only yeah. twofold. But um, There's a big yeah. worry there about getting bur buried under a load of mediocre machine generated content i think that you know you hear hear a lot but on the on the um optimistic side i suppose the thing is that now that um ai is more something that happens within language that is we can feel it that's giving a great acceleration to the development of a 
used to AI. So that, that, that's an interesting thing. Turning now more generally to the role of L&D in organisations, how do you feel about that? Is it changing in significant ways? And what role might the language we use play in steering that change in more beneficial ways, do you think? That's a good question. So I can only talk for the context that I'm in and what I'm seeing, the perception I have. Um, I, th I, I don't think L&D's role is changing much to be honest with you. There's other requirements to how we deliver our solutions today based on people coming into the company and their preferences. I'm not gonna take talk about generational research and set Y, Z and all that, because one, I don't know enough about it. Two, it's I'm not sure it's a problematical area. It really yeah, is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's not step into that. Um, but, but there's other requirements to how we deliver our product. And that also comes from CO2 regulations on how people can travel, because um, that's going to limit uh, the way that we get together and how we use our time together to, um, to do the interventions we need uh, in learning development. So there are different requirements to how we work um, and, and different interactions with new people coming in and their expectations to the whole world and how we do it. I still believe, I mean, I've talked about, I've thought about this quite an, uh, a lot lately. I'm still getting e-learnings on random topics in the inbox, mandatory stuff that's been developed in the old fashioned way, the same way it was 15, 20 years ago, signing off on it and then moving on. And I know it's a reality for pretty much anyone I know. So in the 15 years that I've been here uh, in the learning um, industry context and working in learning development, a lot hasn't really changed. And I think um, it's, it's moving very much slowly, um, slower than we think. And I, that's probably a premise that I should underline is time is so underrated. It takes a lot longer to make these changes that we want to make in companies with people and with ourselves. And I think the biggest favor we can do to ourselves in learning and development is focusing on the mindset of how we service the organization. And it's difficult because the requirement for, from the organization hasn't changed either. We have a population of people. You are now responsible for making sure that we have a track of the development, that we're looking into what courses and training do they need to perform in their role. So we need that overview. And now we've added skills as well. And everyone's talking about the skills gaps and skills driven uh, stuff. And so we also have to oversee that to some extent and cater the organization to, to do that uh, organizational workforce planning and all sorts of other things that we need to do as part of learning and development as we have a, we have a, a say in those things and a way in and, and have to relate to it and, and sometimes also service the organization with these things. So that's evolving a little bit. It's getting wider. Uh, but the one thing that we're not focusing too much on, because we simply don't have the resources, the time, in the context of all the other things that we're asked to do, is to do the important interventions where we can see there's a problem and we can create real value. And I'm talking business impact for people. And it's not only when I say business impact, people start thinking about productivity measures and, and very, you know, not human centered, but it could also be well-being. It could be happiness. It could be many other things that we know from research is contributing to results for the company and people. So those interventions are the most important, in my opinion. And the mindset around defining where's the problem that we're trying to solve and how do we get to a solution? That's what I would love us to, in learning development, to kind of say, and this is, going, this is completely nonsense because it's not going to happen. Say to the organization, fair game that you want us to deliver content for all these topics, for all of the people. It's already on the internet. And we can just purchase licenses forever and it's not going to change anything. But if you really want us to provide value to the company, we will focus in on these interventions because they take departure in these business problems. I hear that so much that people feel detached in learning development from the business. 
from the business results, from affecting real business problems, from solving things, which is so satis- you know, satisfactory. There's nothing better than being part of solving something that will make the world better for, for people or, or a company, right? But we're just not focusing in on those specific things because we're very busy catering with what the business asks us to do, which is programs, content, platforms, all sorts of other things. And that is the game, John. And I can't change it. We're probably going to have a hard time changing it. But I think what we can do, and I'm seeing that slowly moving in the right direction, is focusing on the mindset of what's the problem that we're really trying to solve here? And can we make a difference with learning interventions or training in this to be part of the solution? I think that mindset is super, super important. And the more we can do that with data, with design thinking, uh, analysis, and being a little bit more brave and bold saying, we'll cater this. Yeah, fair enough. It's going to be a bulk of our, of our task. We can't get rid of it. So let's do it and do it well. But at the same time, let's also hyper-focus on some of the most important things that's stressing out the business and how we can help in those contexts and then prove that we've helped. And then we don't have to worry about the voice at the table either um, because we can prove it. Marvellous. That's a, a really interesting answer. Um, and it, it's making me think on our theme of language that maybe one of the things that really changed in the professions when we started talking about learning rather than training uh, and education, which perhaps have um, more limited kind of ambitions. The, 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 the idea that you are now ahead of learning in an organization raises all sorts of expectations about what you're doing for people in, 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 in the way of development and well-being that perhaps weren't there in their previous roles. And it's interesting that some people t- seem more and more keen to talk about training now. You, when you hear the word trainings, you know, um, changing it from a verb into a noun, which normally in business it goes the other way around. You know, mm-hmm. target becomes a ver- verb having been a noun. Training now becomes a noun having been a verb. Uh, and probably, perhaps that's a way that people can limit so, some of the ambition which causes. I think it must cause a great deal of stress to feel that you're supposed to have to do this and actually you spend all your, your time doing compliance, whatever. Anyway, lastly, um, who do you, we, we've, meant, we've name checked a couple of people. We name checked mm. Aigler and uh, Bob Mosher uh, and, and some others. But who else do you follow slash rate slash listen to in the industry to get your knowledge and inspiration? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I did I did make a, a little list here as as, as a preparation. Um, I probably had a few more people doing the the listing up of people here because there's so many smart people, and um, also a part of getting old is I'm starting to listen more and more um, to people I don't agree with to understand their intentions. Yes, and also because getting older for me has been a journey into discovering that I am wrong a lot of the time and I can get better at a lot of things. Um, and people have the best intentions behind what they do, you know, 99.9 of the time, percent of the time. So why not be curious about that? Um, so uh, realizing that as I'm getting older uh, also makes me put some people on the list here that I don't necessarily agree with in their take, but I do learn from it because I get to reflect from their posts and their opinions and maybe, you know, expand my horizon a little bit from time to time. I think that's also what learning is about, isn't it? Um, so only listening to the people I I agree with would be, would be the wrong way around. So I'm not going to point out who I disagree with or who <laughs> I have uh, anyone, you know, mm, but these are great people to follow. Um, I follow Nick Shackleton Jones a lot. Um, I think his take on the world is always one, two, three steps ahead of most people and 10 steps ahead of me. And um, so he's a popular dude in in the learning development uh, space. And he's written this book called How People Learn. And you can agree and disagree with the whole effective context uh, paradigm and the 5DI framework, but I think it makes a lot of sense. So um, I follow him a lot. Uh, Laurie Niles Hoffman is one of my favorite people. 
she keeps it real and she knows her way around both from the company side and the provider side and offers some really great inputs on reality checks also the buzzwords um i follow ethan mollick around uh, ai mm -hmm. he's not specifically in learning developments as such uh, professor he uh, posts a lot about ai and large language models and he contextualizes things into a um uh, you know, paradigm I understand at least. So um, I enjoy those. Uh, Mark Sousa and us and his time boxing and all the things around um, machine learning and trying to filter out the noise of the world. I enjoy that. Detlef Holt from Roche. And um, it's a great one to follow. He often summarizes um, a lot of the uh, insights from other people. And that is useful because then you don't have to go to the 40 people. Then you can look at deadlifts post and then you can get a summary and then you can start from there which is really nice and expand your network from there so um um and actually of course um I listen a lot to what she has to say she's super underrated in my opinion um and you know i think she gets more airtime now than previously because of the whole ai that we're all interested in and she seems to be the renowned expert right now which i really enjoy but but she is a humble person and uh, but she is super skilled um, I learn from her every day. And uh, and then there's a, a guy called uh, Greg Dietra as well that I also follow, um, who's a, an, an AI expert also in the learning space. He's uh, he's also really skilled. But primarily, and I'm going to stop now, I know the list is really long. Sorry if this is <laughs> <it's> too long. <laughs> but other business areas, I mean, we can't just keep looking into the learning and development space. We have to look into, I mean, data is super important for me, obviously. So, we have to look at people who work with data outside learning development and learn from their practices. Data has been a discipline much more uh, wide and great, other, you know, deeper in other uh, business areas like finance, for one, um, product, productivity. Um, follow people there, marketing people. If we have to, and we've talked about that before uh, as well, if we have to you know, target people at the right time, the right place, we need to know something about them from the data. But we also need the right marketing approach to make sure that we put the right people, the right, the right things in front of the right people at the right time. So marketing people, UI, UX people. And then here comes the final one, data ethics people. So one of the fallbacks around being in love with AI and data and how to utilize data to give people better experiences is also what data can you use? How should you use it? And what shouldn't you do with data? And, and also understanding, if you're talking about building an AI engine right now that would recommend things to people or an AI content uh, um, creator, or whatever you're doing with AI in your company, consider the data set behind it. So now the large language models have access to the whole world. But is that going to keep on going like that or will the people who own all this material on the internet say hey no and that's actually happened a couple of times i know the new york times said hey no don't mm. use our materials for your engine i i have a suspicion that that's going to happen more and more that people would like to own and hold on to their data either to make money or also to say no it's actually it's actually our work you, you, you're not gonna you're not gonna build on that so um without our you know involvement or whatever it is so the data sets, access to data, but also the ethics of what you're using. Is it, is it the right thing that you do? Uh, I'm also learning a lot from, from things like that. Thanks. That, that, that's a wonderful, long, comprehensive list. And, Sorry. Um, no, don't, don't apologize. It's brilliant because I think it's very helpful to people. I would, I'd love to, we could talk for another hour about the, um, the New York Times um, court case because I think that is fantastically interesting, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact that people are using uh, ChatGPT to get around their paywall was, that's a real surprise to me that that could happen <laughs> and throws a completely different, you know, I, as a content producer myself in various ways and someone who still gets some um, royalties from a, a musical past, I'm very much in favour of people being able, to, being able to hang on to their copyrights. Yeah. On the other hand, I see the the opposite point of view as well. You're a person who sees both sides of a question, and I think that's been very interesting. I mean, you, you keep alluding to how you're getting old, but it, 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 you're mellowing like a fine wine, Peter. 
And thank you very much for pouring out some of that vintage for us today. It's been a fascinating discussion, uh, and I'm really glad that you could do it. Thanks for coming along. I appreciate it. I think it was a great conversation. And that metaphor I'm going to take with me. I hope I can use that uh, going forward myself, John. Which wraps it up neatly on the language theme. Thanks a lot. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guest and to our sponsors. The Learning Hack is among the top 5% most listened to podcasts globally, according to Listen Notes, we found out. But it depends for its existence solely on sponsorship and your Patreon contributions. If you want us to continue holding these excellent conversations about learning, it's you who said they're excellent, not us. Let's have a chat about your company sponsoring or sign up to patreon.com slash learning hack for a piddlingly small amount of money, get transcripts, text summaries and early access. Keep us alive. Until next time. Stay curious, learning people. Now I finally get it. <laughs>